Good day. I'm Mike Palm, one of four managing partners at Convergent Results. I'll begin by sharing our observations on the electric utility industry and ComEd's position in that industry. I'll introduce Convergent Results, our people, and what we do. Then I want to turn back to ComEd and understand more of your business objectives, in particular the 2016 objectives, and follow up with our capabilities and how we might be able to help accelerate and exceed those objectives. I'll wrap up with how we work, what are the next steps for moving ahead together. We examined the FERC F1s for the largest utilities in the U.S. We looked at each utility individually from 2010 through 2015. In aggregate, for the group as a whole, revenues have declined by 1.3%. In that same time period, T&D maintenance costs increased by 19.3%. Adjusting that figure for inflation, that brings the increase to 12%. When we discuss this with other utilities, we get comments like, we can't just keep going back to the PUC for more money. We've also heard that continuous improvement has been working to correct this all along. ComEd has the second largest divergence between the revenues and T&D maintenance costs, and this is our third visit to ComEd to discuss this phenomenon. We started conversion results in 2006, but the managing partners have known each other for far longer than that. I've mentioned that we were the operations directors for fact-based management. Prior to that, going back to the mid-1980s, we were associated with a firm called United Research, later Gemini. I've known Larry Clements for his entire consulting career. Prior to that, he was a plant manager at Kodak. Currently, he is the president of the Lean Division on the board of the Institute of Industrial Engineers. For myself, at one point in my career, I was director of Methods and Resource Management at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Maryland, a white-collar operation. In today's terminology, that would be director of Six Sigma and work management. I point this out because we are all Deming practitioners. We know that Deming is highly effective at improving operational performance, whether it's white-collar or blue-collar. I've worked in all the same industries as Larry, and I am certified in Reliability, Project Management, and Six Sigma. These are some of the clients that Larry and I have worked on together. Kent Carlson is our manufacturing engineer. He started off as an engineer in high-tech companies. Later, he moved into consulting, working with clients on their maintenance and engineering programs. Steve Ballard is different from the rest of us. He was a client when Shell Oil contracted United Research to design and implement work management processes. Steve led the design and implementation of work management processes in over 30 different operations. Those implementations are still in place today. Steve got such great satisfaction out of working with clients, helping them to implement work management, and also enjoying the tangible benefits that come as a result he moved into consulting. These are some of the clients that Steve and Kent have worked with. Our people are like us, deep in experience in industry and consulting. We have people who were construction managers, planner schedulers, and supervisors in the gas and electric utilities industry. With that background, we bring a lot of experience with us that we can provide you different options that you may not have thought of previously. We work with your people. We're not presenters, we're not recommenders. We work with your people to develop the changes to be made, taking their input, and engaging them totally in the process. We work with your people to custom design the solution that we put together for you, working with our background and their background for your best fit. Our logo calls out the triad of purpose, process, and people. We begin with a client by identifying their purpose. What are the business objectives that they have to achieve? We look at the processes that support achievement of these objectives and integrate Deming's plan, do, check, and act. That is the self-correcting elements of a process that assure operational excellence. For the people, 
we use the motivational cycle of change. It begins by involving people in the design of the change. Management supports their being involved in the change. Then the people begin to change their behaviors. They're successful in making those changes. And they recognize that they've been able to achieve a new level of performance. This motivates them to become more heavily involved. This is organizational buy-in and the basis for long-term sustainability. All of this adds up to tangible, measurable, real results for the company. Of the three, purpose, process, and people, people is the most important element. We say this because we've seen where a less than textbook perfect process has achieved its objectives because the people understood what the organization needed. To be successful working with people, you have to work in three dimensions, the rational, political, and emotional. Rational is the facts and data about the change. Political is the power structure, who influences whom in the organization. And the emotional is the very personal part of what's going to happen to me. Most change initiatives are very good at the rational. They've developed the compelling reason for change, and they have the business case supporting it. They have all the project management tools, but eight out of ten of these initiatives fail to achieve their objectives. The reason for this is that they did not have a structured way to work with the other two dimensions, political and emotional. At Convergent Results, we have a structured, copyrighted method for working with both the political and the emotional. For the political, one key in our political method is that we work with a joint team. As we start with an organization, we look for those individuals in the organization who are informal leaders. They are the people that both management and employees listen to. We bring them in to become equals on the design and implementation team in developing the new process. With the executive team, we're constantly looking ahead four to six weeks for those opportunities where they can go out into the organization to show their support and give positive reinforcement. One element of the organization that is highly underutilized is the line supervision and union leadership. What happens in communications is that you'll have a general communication about the changes coming, and it goes out to the general population, including supervisors and the union leadership at the same time. So if you watch that, you'll see how the people will turn to their most trusted people in the organization, the supervisors and the union leadership, and they'll ask them about the change, but they are not equipped to answer their employees' questions about the change. We do that differently in that we prepare line supervision and union leadership ahead of time, tell them what the change is coming, and go through their questions to prepare them to be able to answer those questions after the communication with the general population. For the emotional, there's a number of things that we do. A key in that is employee engagement, widespread participation in the design of the change. We'll ask for people's input. We'll ask everybody for their input around what works and what we need to keep and also what's broken and needs to be fixed. We identify the roles and responsibilities around the changes so that everybody knows what's going to remain the same and what they're going to have to do differently. When it comes to implementation, we've found that classroom training is not adequate for all people to learn the new changes. They need coaching in the live organization. So as we go into implementation, each person that's going to be affected by the change is assigned an implementation coach. That coach will go out to them after the training to work with them on actually performing the changes and help them with individual solutions, or they could come back, work with the organization, and change the process to better suit the employees. Overall of this is communication. We develop with the organization a communication plan that addresses each stakeholder, identifies what the message needs to be, the frequency that message needs to come across, and the medium in which it should be delivered. These are examples 
of what our gas and electric clients have been able to achieve working with convergent results. It's important to note that these were measured and reported by the client's financial group, not convergent results. And the achievements vary because the client's objectives varied. They wanted to use productivity improvement in various ways. At the top, there's reduced overtime and contractor usage. That ties back to their objective. In the next one, there's a $6 million reduction in O&M. That's what they had to achieve. And then finally, if you look down below the second kicker box, you'll see that they eliminated an eight-year backlog of work orders. That was their objective. Now I want to talk about ComEd. We need to understand more about your business objectives, your purposes, in 2016 and beyond. Looking back at 2010 through 2015, these are the revenues by year. The scale is on the left in millions. Over that same time period, this is the plot for T&D maintenance costs. The trend for the revenues is down, while the trend for costs is up. What that means is there's been a significant difference in the rate of change and the direction of change for costs and revenues. At the 100,000 foot level, it looks like t and maintenance costs have increased by 24%, while the revenues have decreased by 22%. Using the analytical method of best demonstrated performance, coming from the years of 2010 through 2015, it looks like there's 47 to $80 million in cost reductions possible for 2016. With that as background, we have questions about ComEd strategies. In particular, your key objectives for 2016. Regarding cost management, we've heard that a key phrase is to bend the cost curve. We're wondering if you also have some objectives around reliability and customer service. How are you handling the new regulations requiring uh, a full test in place of visual inspections? Do you have some objectives around operational improvement, including things like improve wrench time by 20%, reduce overtime and contractor costs, eliminate some stubborn late backlogs, or implement a new reliability program without increasing manpower? Maybe you've got some objectives to increase the planner scheduler and the line supervisor skills with some training or implement and coordinate kitting with job scheduling. Perhaps you've got something around implementing root cause analysis, cross-functional problem solving to eliminate those recurring problems and delays in the field. Once we understand a client's business objectives, we use a business analysis to configure a project that's custom tailored for their specific needs. This is a list of our capabilities or service offerings any one of which we can include in a project. For example, there's planner scheduler training. We work with planner schedulers to produce consistent estimates and put together job packages. We can do project management, working with the construction management folks on how they oversee the projects and coordinate an entire portfolio of projects. We can also do failure modes and effects analysis, FMEA, looks to develop the most effective preventive maintenance. There's one I'd like to call attention to, and that's work management. This is a service offering that encompasses many of these different capabilities. Work management is the process of how work is managed, not how it's performed. This is not a Six Sigma effort. This is a work management effort. It is based on proven best practices not analytically derived improvements, and it produces step change versus continuous improvement. Continuous improvement typically is about a 4 to 5% improvement per year versus step change with work management that can be anywhere from 20% or more increases in productivity. There's a definite hierarchy or sequence you need to go through in achieving operational excellence. You start with the basics. The Lean Masters will tell you 
that you have to get control of the process before you do anything else. Once you have that control, then you can build on that base, the work management processes and how you manage the work. We've been told by reliability managers in some of the large manufacturing concerns that they have to have work management and process before they can be effective with RCM, Reliability Centered Maintenance. They need to know that the improvements they put together can in fact be executed by the organization. Once the work management processes are in place, then you begin work with the work processes and methods improvements followed by the organizational changes. Dialing down in some detail, this is where Deming's Plan, Do, Check, and Act come into play. The little bricks infer that there's a lot more detail underneath Plan, Do, Check, and Act. I'll get into some of that later. Once that's in place, then you can go into your process improvements, the Lean Manufacturing Six Sigma Reliability Centered Maintenance. From that point also, then you can get into automation, the Enterprise Asset Management System or the Computerized Maintenance Management Systems. Once that's in place, you have those tools in place, then go to the organizational changes like customer-focused teams. All too often we see organizations that step right over work management. They prefer instead to pursue the glitzy next big thing like lean maintenance, agile, or reliability-centered maintenance. As we discuss, this leaves an organization without the ability to implement the improvements that come from these programs. Deming points out that management that relies on automation as a panacea for fixing operating problems is actually inhibiting performance improvement. The asset management programs that are sweeping across the country are another example. Over half of the activities laid out in asset management are, in fact, work management activities. There's that base again that appears you have to have the ability, the basic disciplines to execute. Looking at IT systems that have been designed for work management, understandably, those processes identify the interfaces with the computer. They define where to input data and where to take it away. They do not cover the responsibilities and management actions that have to happen outside the computer. So, for example, they do not cover how to estimate. They do not cover how to interpret KPIs. They don't talk about how to set expectations with people when you go to execute work, nor do they talk about how to follow up. Why is this happening? It's because work management processes are simply assumed to be in place and fully effective. It's so basic, organizations just simply feel that it's already there. So what are these responsibilities around work management processes? We have copyrighted a portfolio of work management best practices. We use these best practices in our business analysis to benchmark your current management processes. We've developed these over the course of 30 years, identifying those that are the most effective methods for managing work. The best practices are confirmed by various professional groups and publications. These include SMRP, the Institute of Industrial Engineers, and various authors like Terry Weirman, Senjay Nakajima, and Doc Palmer. Returning to our results bullseye, I'll dial deeper into the best practices process. Throughout the process, we clarify roles and responsibility. We identify who's accountable and who's responsible for performing each of the activities in the process. Plan, how to identify, prioritize, and plan and schedule work. Do, how to align workloads with organizational capacity and then execute get the work started. Check is how you follow up on work. And when you follow up, how do you adjust when the work has not followed the plan and when the job is over, what do you record? Finally, act. What are the key process measures and who is responsible to review and act on those measures when they don't meet the targets? In the center is process management. 
How do you manage the process? How do you update it when it needs to be changed? How do you train people that come in new to the organization to their unique roles and responsibilities in the process? We can walk some of these best practices through a very high-level process flow. What you see now are key players or functions in getting the work done. It begins with work initiation that comes from telephone calls, verbals, or work requests that goes into a priority screening function. The actual equipment, conditions, and health, safety, and environmental criteria are all part of the prioritization. If the priority is high enough, it can go directly to the crews to be performed. If not, it goes to a planner scheduler who will pull all the materials and documentation together, get that ready for scheduling, and when the hours, the material, and the documentation is ready, they'll put that on a schedule and give it to the crews. The crews perform the work, and when they're done, they make entries into the equipment history, and if they were not able to follow the plan as it was laid out, they identify deviations. That and the key process indicators goes into the review process. Additionally, downtime information, reliability information, will go pick up information from the equipment histories, and then that will go for review as well. The group that's reviewing the performance can assign teams to go improve specific problems that occurred. They can, in turn, generate work orders that will change equipment or procedures. An example of these improvement teams is reliability engineering. I want to dial down inside reliability engineering to show you the process in reliability engineering and the identification of the various activities that go on.